Chris, can you still see us? Can you still hear us? Over. Roger, four blisses is straight out. We have good audio and good video. How about us? I'd like to welcome everybody here. Uh, really, I asked to uh, do this uh, um, really professional development session uh, with the G3, and Mr. Dave Pascal is here to do that, to work with Dave before he was over at the OETSC, but probably down the near city center uh, before they moved over here and became the, they, they used to be the training brain. Now they're the OETSC. Uh, but uh, now working in the, inside of the TRADOX G357, and as General Perkins says, you could, you could be thinking right now, it's like, hey, what does this have to do with ARCIC? But this has to do with the relationship of the variables. Uh, and when you introduce something like uh, grow the Army by 7,000, 10,000, uh, what does that mean to base, how many basic training companies, how many AIT uh, platoon sergeants do we need? Uh, what's the flow of people? What mission goes to a recruiting command? How many ROTC seats? Uh, uh, what's the shortage? What goes to OCS? You know, all these things are all related. And uh, we have a piece of this inside of ARCIC, but the thing I think about is those, uh, not the discrete values of uh, how many soldiers are coming in, but it's a relationship between the variables that I think is important. And so I, I asked uh, Mr. Pascal to come here to, to give us essentially a, a pitch. Um, it's related to increasing Army in strength, but you could turn that to what happens when you get a downsize uh, in mission. And then what does it mean for the recruiting guys as they're out there trying to get, uh, you know, General Snow said this week uh, 80,000 soldiers, and I think, uh, Dave, you'll cover part of that. But it's like, you know, what is the – What's the north side of the building doing, and what's the south side of the building doing? And uh, so I appreciate uh, Dave you coming in and, and talking to us. And, and so I'll be thinking about um, what questions you might have uh, for uh, the south side of the building uh, in relationship to what we do inside of Arctic. So, Dave, over to you. Thank you. Fine, I'm going to walk and talk if that's all right with you. Appreciate the opportunity to come here, and I, I guess we, we put some signs up. My mom would be impressed, my name uh, out in the hallway there. Build a Better Soldier, uh, that was the title of one of the slides, but it was really about the efforts, uh, as General Dias highlighted, what we had to accomplish uh, this past year, what we're going to accomplish this uh, next year, hopefully accomplish this next year. But I will tell you, and I don't mean this in a, in a negative sense, um, very few senior leaders understand the accessions process and what it takes to take a young man or woman from high school and get them into the foxhole. As you know, as you well know, in 2012, we just established uh, accessions command. And I will tell you right now, uh, there is nobody that takes a look at this process from start to finish. So as a senior leader says, uh, hey, let's grow the Army, they oftentimes look at General Snow, who's got a huge part of it, and says, can you recruit 6,000 more? Sure, that's going to make it happen. No one's yet to look at the Army Marketing Group. Nobody looks at General Perkins. Do you have the training seats, etc.? So what I'm going to really do is kind of give you a little history lesson of what we accomplished. But to understand that history lesson, you have to have an appreciation for the process writ large. You need to understand that we program training two and three years out. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that, how we adjust during the year flow. And then as General Dias uh, aptly pointed out, it's those second and third order or unintended consequences that, that we've had to deal with. I will tell you that um, for me personally and about a large portion of TRADOC, but a very small team uh, manage this. It, it became time consuming, it became all consuming uh, of my efforts, so much so that internally within G357, we are standing up an accessions directorate led by an 06. Um, and again, very small organization, what used to be led by a three star. Uh, we took four or five positions, and I will tell you that we assigned the accessions directorate some long ball hitters. It wasn't, let's, let's get our duds over there. We gave them some of our best and brightest. But it's an enterprise that approach, and I'm going to highlight that during the meeting. So these five people uh, are really 
USAREC, Cadet Command, the Department of the Army, and I'll talk a little bit about the, the friction between the Army G1 and HRC who works for the G1 and some of those challenges. So it's a tough mission, but it goes back to that holistic look at, at what it takes. So if we go to the next slide, here was the problem. December of last year, the NDA was passed, uh, increasing the Army growth. Um, so back to what I said, our, our training mission, our our, print, our Army program for individual training, was produced two years prior. We were on a downward trend. So in December, the NDA was passed. Uh, that says grow the Army. I've got another slide. I'm going to talk a little bit about what that looked like. Well, David, authorized. The authorized. Thank you, sir. That was my next comment. We did not have an appropriation to grow that. And what you're going to see or what you should take away from this is oftentimes money and resources are late to need. You just can't create a drill sergeant tomorrow. Hey, we're going to train 6,000 more. Where are those drill sergeants? Where are those AIT instructors coming from? Next slide. So here's what it looked like. Here was where the Army was at. So as again, I said uh, the, the NDA came out in December. Even without the appropriation, we started leaning forward in the saddle. I'll tell you some of the things that we did. I'm going to focus today's comments on the active Army. This was a total Army problem, but if you look at where the Guard and Reserve were in relation to their target, they were relatively close. It really wasn't a challenge for them to make their end strength, but I will tell you that, unfortunately, the Guard fell a little short this year by about 2,000. But I'm really going to focus on the active Army. So we were on this downward trend to a 460K. Our accession mission, the mission letter that's produced by the Army G1, had the requirements to bring in X amount of soldiers. That number was 62.5. So that's what General Snow and his recruiters uh, were, were scheduled to bring in. So we had a 16K growth. Literally, uh, the four stars were sitting around with the chief, and uh, General uh, Milley, as he's apt to do, said, Operational forces, I want you to increase retention mission by 9K. Next slide, please. Officer accessions, General Perkins bring in 1,000 extra officers, uh, and let's bring in 6,000 new soldiers. So that was literally the thought process on how this was divvied up amongst the, uh, the ACOMPs to make it happen. I'll talk a little bit about the accessions, uh, the, the, uh, the retention mission. The, so... Pretty big challenge. Again, quartered away through the year, built a plan. They offered quite a few bonuses, multiple levers to be pulled. That 9K accessions plan required 100% of every eligible soldier to reenlist between June and September to reenlist. Okay, those of you that have been in the Army and worked the retention mission, that's a pretty big challenge. I'm here to tell you that they didn't make that challenge. The, the best that the Army has ever done, they call it a take mission from retention, was 62%, just under 63%. It was at the height of the war. We had large bonuses, and we had large bonuses downrange, you know, so it was tax-free, et cetera. And we, we pulled in at just under 63%. So plan was built on a flawed premise that we were going to get 9K there. Nobody came to General Perkins and said, hey, are you going to increase that? Let me talk a little bit about the officer sessions. How long, how long does it take to produce an officer? If you go to West Point, that's four years. ROTC, you kind of get it in two years. If you go to OCS, uh, you know, 10, 12 weeks. But uh, again, in the year of execution, we didn't have that. We didn't have that ready to go. So a couple things that the department uh, was able to do. First was the request for relief from active duty, whether that be to get out of the Army early or to transfer. I guess there's X number of folks that come in and want to go to a sister service. Those were all declined. That only opened up about 200, 233. So we, TRADOC, went through Cadet Command, working with General Hughes uh, and his team. Uh, we were going to bring cadets forward. And again, this is some of the numbers game when you deal with accessions. So we had cadets that are commissioned that were scheduled to go to school in October or November. We were going to have them report early so they could get on to active duty. Hey, Sergeant Major, 
Take my seat up here, please. Um, so we were going to bring them in. Again, a numbers game. Bring them in early. Report in September. They're on the Army end strength. Well, that helps us get the end strength, but that doesn't help us with next year's number. We continue to dig a hole with regards to that. We also had uh, about 500 lieutenants that came through the ROTC program that were scheduled that had asked to come on active duty, but we didn't have the authorizations. They were going to a reserve uh, organization, a guard or reserve organization. We offered them the option to come back on active duty. Uh, and about 500, uh, of the 500, about 380 accepted that. So we, we're slowly but surely moving forward. And then we offered a recall to active duty. Those officers that had gotten out of the Army or were currently serving in the IRR or had a remaining commitment, do you want to come back on active duty? And uh, interesting enough, that was about 20, uh, about 1,780 came forward. So I would tell you the goodness of that, if you went back to the accessions or the retention mission, they missed it by about 2,700, but these officer accessions, excess officer accessions, and a little bit of uh, extra capacity that General Snow was able to produce allowed the active Army to make their 476 end strength. We, we made it by about literally 300 extra soldiers uh, throughout the fiscal year. I'm going to focus the rest of the presentation on this 6K, the accessions, uh, and the recruiting, and, the, re and the, uh, the training mission, and some of the things that we had to do to make this happen. But Next slide. Th that 6K is on top of some plateau that was already established. Yeah, that 6K, 6K was 6K more. Uh, yeah, 6K above. So remember the recruiting mission, if you, if you will, it was 62.5. So when you add that 6K, General Snow's mission went from 62.5 to 68.5. So that was a 6,000 quartered away, quartered away through the fiscal year. Remember, the training seats had been programmed for quarters two, three, and four. Where are these extra 6,000 soldiers going to come from? And this is what we're going to talk about here. Next slide. Hey, sir, before you go forward, over here. Yes, sir. Hey, I got it. Hey, yeah, please interrupt me and ask questions. Why would we as an Army give a mission of 100% retention in the field when we know that the, that the best we ever get was 62%? I mean, why even, why even go there? Why not plan on maybe 50% or 45% just from base? And well, why, why put your commanders in the field in that situation? I don't, I don't have a very good answer for it. I will tell you, it's cheaper to retain a soldier right. than it is to train a soldier. Um, a 6K increase in the accession mission during the year of execution was huge. The, the best we ever did during the war years was about 7,000 a year. 6K was on the extent of it. So it was, it really, everybody was trying to pull their weight. I told you how that decision was made. Right. And I guess there's a little bit of, uh, it was literally, here, Abrams, you do 9K, Perkins, you do 6K, Perkins, you do 1,000K. That was kind of how it was occurred. Was there appropriate staff analysis behind that? Probably not, uh, but it was, and again, we put a challenge on those, uh, uh, on those commanders in the field. Do we want, and again, let's go back to the commanders in the field. Do we want to keep everybody we had, whoever said that? No, there are soldiers that probably need to leave the Army. Well, One I of the requirements as we went to this 6K uh, increase, we were not going to lower the standards. Standards with, which is uh, the 90% high school graduates and above, and a 60% of our CAT one through three as we go forward. So that was one of our challenges. During the war years, we lowered the standards. We had quite a few waivers for previous offenses, drug offenses, et cetera. And many of us lived that problem of those soldiers that came into the Army less than desirable. So that, that was a piece hey, of sir, it. Sir, can I add a little bit of Please. what Wayne said? I mean, messaging is important. And one of the other things that we did uh, that I don't think you mentioned, sir, is we canceled QSP boards oh, last year. So yeah, there was, there was a whole bunch. 
Yeah, and those were fully qualified soldiers that just due to force design decisions in previous years could have very well been separated. Yeah. So, so, that, so that's, that was a good news story. When you look at increase in the Army, Sergeant Major, there are quite a few levers that the Army could peel. So it's the, the QSP boards. We raise the retention rates for a sergeant first class, staff sergeants, officers. Uh, so, so there were multiple levers that were pulled to try to make this end strength. Uh, I have the pleasure of sitting in the program update brief with the Army G1 on a monthly basis. If you're ever bored and you want to have your eyes pulled out, you, you know, feel free to join me. But, you know, the big brain horses at the Department of the Army have loss and attrition models. And every month they brief that to the G1. Are we on track to make the end strength, not make the end strength? They identify historical patterns, levers that need to be pulled. So there's a variety of things uh, that went into it. But again, really the focus that I really wanted to highlight was what we in TRADOC uh, had to accomplish this past year. So on the operating concept, you're very familiar as uh, you deal with General Perkins many times. What are the first order of principles? So we pulled from the Army operating concept. This is what we want to train. This is the product that we need to provide to the operational force. Uh, and then down below, much to no big surprise to you, we need facilities, trainers, and the equipment that's going to be required. And the resources for the increase is where we're going to spend a little bit of time now uh, as we try to move this forward. Next slide. So that's where we came up with building a soldier. This was the one chart, and I apologize for its small size, and it's an eye chart, that uh, General Perkins used to brief the acting secretary of the Army. Again, he uses the term the factory. If you worked at Volvo or Toyota or Chevy, and you wanted to create a larger product, you would buy a building, you'd get some workers, and then you would go ahead, tool the factory, and you'd start producing. We're going to do this in flight, okay? A soldier is not in the Army until they go through the assessments process and get to the reception battalion. So the Army maintains what's called the DEP, the delayed entry pool. So that means Dave Pascal signs up to be an 88 Mike, a mechanic that's going to go to school right here. I could sit in the depth upwards of a year. Soldiers come into the Army, they don't all come at one time. There's a huge chunk after basic training. Then we kind of dip down a little bit during the second quarter, third and fourth quarter picks up. We try to use the depth to optimize flow through the training base. The depth had been pillaged the year prior to make mission was going to be pillaged this year. It's important to understand that the recruiters are able to recruit against a seat that's in ATARS, the Army Training System, the Army Training Reservation System. We don't recruit to basic training. We recruit you for an AIT. Toma, uh, up on the second deck there, takes a look at when you're scheduled to go to training, and then we backward plan when you should go to basic training. We try to pick a location that's close, et cetera. So this was really to kind of highlight to the senior leaders what is required to take a soldier from the street, get them into MEPS. MEPS, the Army is the executive agent for the military entrance processing station. However, we don't run it. So as we are, hey, we'd like to open MEPS on the weekend for our recruiters. Sorry, we're not going to open on the weekends. We only work Monday through Friday. So that part of this you're going to get is the accessions and the training process is an enterprise approach. And I'll talk a little bit more. MEPS is the first partner. AM AMC and IMCOM are critical players as we're trying to grow the training base. So this was really just to highlight. But they're not counted as a soldier while they're in MEPS. They only counted as a soldier when they get to basic training. Affirmative, sir. Once they get through... The, uh, we have a return. large group of people who come into the Army after high school graduation, not necessarily graduate in December. They graduate in the June time frame. So that's why I think the CG calls it laminar flow so that you have uh, the ability to utilize your facilities all through the year as okay. opposed to stacking it, uh, being overcrowded in the, in the summer and being nobody there in the wintertime. Perfect, sir. And the ideal number for the depth is about 21,000. It's about 9,000, and we, we dipped into it again. It's probably 
close to about 7,500 right now. The depth is down. So as sessions is down, the depth is down. But this was really, this is what General Perkins is one slide that he uses to brief the senior leaders on the factory, the Tradoc factory from high school into the foxhole, showing the different numbers of uh, uh, the different length of the courses. The other part that the General Perkins wanted to try to highlight was, and, and as General Dias just highlighted, um, if you want to get soldiers in the Army to make end strength, you have to get them into basic training. We thereby have created an unintended consequence of holdovers or hold-unders. And we use that term. Again, we just got to get you on so we can make the end strength. But I might not, we might not have the AIT instructors available. We call it a holdover or a hold-under because we had to roll that. Fort Benning might have the capacity to keep Pascal in place until his AIT starts. Uh, one other location might not, but AIT has a location, so you're going to get snowbirds. We have young men and women waiting nine to ten weeks to attend their advanced individual training. Let's think about the law of unintended consequences. We've had holdovers in basic training for a long time. Kids that get injured, kids that are discipline problems, etc. That number is about 19,000, just over 19,000 a year, and that's spread across the training base. During the surge period this next December, that number is going to expand up to about 5,000, just because we didn't have the AIC, AIT seats available. I'll get to you in a minute. Yes, sir. So now we got a pretty motivated soldier, just finished basic training. I want to get out and see the world. Hey, you're going to paint rocks for about 10 weeks. Oh, by the way, you're going to be hanging out with these other kids that are discipline problems, medical problems, getting chapter. It's kind of like who sponsors that new soldier in the unit? Is it your chapter case or is it the soldier of the quarter? Starting to get, I joined the Army. I'm sitting here for nine weeks, you know, congressional complaints and all the things that you can associate with sitting around for nine weeks, idle hands being the devil's workshop. Oh, by the way, TRADOC is not resourced as you use the ITRIM model. That's the uh, institutional training resource model to manage these holdovers or hold-unders. Who watches these kids during the day, give them a little bit of training, what's going on? Oh, I now have to pull a drill sergeant away from, or an AIT platoon sergeant away from the company where he should be out training. So, Major, I know you wanted to talk. No, sir, actually, just <clears throat> a question for clarity. So, a um, tell me if I'm correct or wrong. A holdover is somebody who graduates basic and stays there, yeah. waiting for a slot. A hold under is somebody who gets moved to his AIT location and hangs yeah. out. Is that and it, yes. Okay. And it all had to do with problem in both locations. It, and it had to do with capacity sure. and barrack space. Okay. Okay, let's use, let's use uh, Fort Eustis for, you know, if you come here, General Dias lives on post, he probably hears kids calling cadence at 2400, don't you? And later. And later. Because of the problems that we've created in many locations, at uh, 35 locations, we do two or three shift training. Right here on post, we do three eight-hour shifts for the 128th. So uh, 24 hours a day. So as this slide was up and we were briefing the... Uh, Acting Secretary of the Army, General Perkins said, the kid that tightened the Jesus nut on the helicopter you flew, learned that about two in the morning, you know? So I think the, uh, the acting says, I'm gonna drive back <laughs> instead of flying. <laughs> so we're gonna get to some of those levers that we have to pull to get there. But this is just a, a quick snapshot of the factory and the flow and what a young man or woman has to do. Next slide. To understand that, we just finished the SMDR, the Structured Manning Decision Review. Ms. Kelly's going to keep me honest. She's the TRADOC lead for that. That process is hosted by the Department of the Army G1 and G3. They take the latest force file, the projected force file, and for this year, we were planning training for 20. They take that latest force file. They review, if you want to watch paint dry, 2,900 classes that the Army officer offers. Everything from basic training to the senior service college. Functional training, PME, and everything in between. They look at historical usage. They took at, look at the rates or the, the requirements for readiness. And then they go by active, guard, reserve, and our international partners and how many seats. 
And at the end of that process, in January, they published what's called the ARPRINT, Army Program for Individual Training. And then we take the next two years to fund and resource that training, okay? 86% of TRADOC's budget is based on the student load in that ARPRINT, so we have to get that right. So if you remember my first slide, we were on a downward trend. Two years ago, we were planning for a 460K active component end strength. Unlike the Marine Corps, Marine Corps basic training, they have a TDA, they have X number of drill sergeants to train their load. In the summer months, they have a ratio of about one to 22 instructor to student ratio. In the winter months, they have about a one to 14, because that's just the way the kids come in the Army. Every year, in collaboration with the G8 in uh, uh, TRADOC G8 and the Army G8, we either expand or contract the training base. So as we were on this downward trend, we might have needed 50 basic training companies. Now we only need 48. So Kelly and myself, we go back into General McFarland to DCG and say, sir, we lost three sets of companies. Here's where they come from. Let's take two from Fort Jackson, two from Fort Benning. So we either expand or contract. So you need to understand this process. Two years ago, we were on a 460K. In the year of execution, it's called a trap, a training resource arbitration panel to you and I. That's an adjustment or a fraggle to the plan that you were provided. That trap covers training seats, equipment required, instructors required, and additional resources. So we're going to bump 6K. It's kind of a math problem. I only have X amount of drill sergeants to train 62.5. I now have to train 68. How are we going to do that? Oh, by the way, remember I said we recruit to AIT seats. So the drill sergeant piece is, is hard. I'm going to tell you how we solve that problem. But where am I going to get an AIT instructor from? Planning purposes, about nine months to train, or to identify, screen, train, and PCS, either a recruiter or a drill sergeant. About nine months is the time that it takes because of PASTA and, and some of the other requirements. PASTA is a position of special trust and authority. Uh, if you have had a previous uh, incident, you could potentially be screened out of being a drill instructor. We're going back, there's two different levels of PASTA. Level one are, I would call them fairly serious offenses. It's either a sexual assault, domestic abuse, or something like that. Probably don't want those, I'm not sure we want those around other soldiers, but we definitely don't want them around newer soldiers. Category two, we screen out about 10% of the population. We're going back to the Army and looking if we could ease some of those restrictions. Category two, you know, Private Pascal may have gotten a DUI in his first unit of assignment. He has since turned his life around. He's been promoted to Staff Sergeant, Sergeant First Class, so he's been promoted three or four times, served on only, got great NCERs, but he's screened out from being a drill instructor or an AIT instructor. Let me go back to traps. The traps really go a little bit to the training centers where we do basic or one station unit training, but the critical players in the traps are the centers and schools where we do AIT. And how do I produce an AIT instructor? Again, happened a quarter of the way through the year. Am I gonna identify Travers and say, hey, you just got uh, nominated to go be an AIT platoon sergeant. How long does it take you to move your family? You're probably not gonna get there in time. Late to need. So now we are forced to go to a contracted solution. We can't have contractors deal with basic trainees, but we could have contracted AIT instructors. Where do you find a Patriot maintainer in the civilian community or a contractor? Anybody know? You gotta hire them and it's going back to a soldier. So remember, retention. We got a 9K mission for the active army retention. TRADOC is now out there fishing for AIT instructors. If you're a Patriot maintainer, you can go three places in the world. Korea, Kuwait, or Fort Sill. Here's TRADOC gonna come in and offer you, hey, Sergeant Dias, I'm gonna give you 100K to do what you're doing right now. Don't have to PCS family, don't have to move. I'll take it. 
So second and third order effects, you know, I pushed on the balloon over here. I am now affecting the active Army's retention mission. We're all starting to fish from the same pool, okay? Manning-wise, AIT, drill sergeants are manned to 100%. AIT instructors are manned to 80% with a, uh, the remainder of that being made up by the contracted workforce. All of a sudden, we have these things called SVAMs, primary requirements, staff sergeants, sergeant first classes, same folks that we would like to be AIT instructors. So we're all, that little pond of available folks, we're all starting to fish from. Really a challenge to, to get at that piece of it. So again, when a senior leader says, well, just go ahead and make it happen. Go ahead and contract for those instructors. They don't understand the impact that we're having on the rest of the Army uh, as we try to move it forward. So again, that's just the orders process and the trap process uh, and, and how we pull all this together. Next slide. So, I just said it takes nine months to grow a recruiter, to grow a drill sergeant. We have a, six, a 6K increase. It's about, uh, we required literally about 600 recruiters was what we, were, what we asked for, what the model re re refers to, and it's been proven about one to 100, so 600 was, was about the right answer. We weren't gonna get those recruiters, and oh, by the way, even if we got them through the nine months, they're probably not that effective on month one. So the first thing we wanted to do is we offered incentives for our recruiters to stay in place another year. We offered them assignment incentive pay to the tune of about $500 a month, but we wanted to be selective. You know, if uh, recruiter Howard hadn't put anybody in the Army, we're not gonna pay him $500 to keep not putting anybody in the Army, but if uh, Ski's doing a great job, he's the guy. So. General Snow and the commanders and sergeants majors were able to target recruiters and offer them assignment incentive pay. We kept about 275 on place in station. So that was a good thing. We had to offer quite a few different contract options for those young men and women out there. The first option was quick ship bonuses depending on the MOS, if you were willing to ship within 30 days, it was a 40K bonus. Not, not, not a bad gig, okay? We offered prior service. If you had been out of the Army for more than three years or you were coming over from a sister, ser sister service, we were sending you to the normal basic training. You got out as a staff sergeant, you probably didn't want to get treated like a private anymore and have, have a brown round, you know, in your face. So we stood up a prior service basic training course. Um, it was six weeks as opposed to the 10 weeks in duration. And that course really focused on physical fitness, leadership, and re you and reintroducing you into the Army. That gained us about 2,500 people. So not, not a bad gig. Uh, to make that happen. Okay, 6,000 people, 200, 220, 240 in a basic training company. I had to stand up, we had to stand up eight additional basic training companies. During the war years, we brought in what were called relocatable barracks. Modular barracks, had a poor pad, run power, run electricity. All those had, because we had been on this downward climb, all those had been turned in. They were not available, ready to use. Fort Jackson had barracks that were mothballed, did not meet the TRADOC standards uh, for occupation, and were scheduled to go into what's called TPUP, Training Barracks Upgrade Program, uh, in about the 2020-2020 uh, the timeframe. We couldn't wait. We had to invest $11 million to bring those barracks up to standard that we could put a young man or woman in there but I still didn't have the drill sergeants, so we literally activated the reserves. So OPCON to the Center for IMT to General Frost are two reserve organizations, 108th, which does drill sergeant basic training, and the 80th Training Command, which helps us out with um, AIT instructors, MOST uh, type training. So we brought on about 180 drill sergeants 
We brought them under ops, ADOS funding. Again, that was not in the budget for this year, so we're back to the burp, asking for money to bring on these reservists. Because it wasn't a MOBE or a partial MOBE, we had to use the volunteer piece. Second and third consequences, these volunteers came from all over the country, but they are now gonna live at Fort Leonard Wood, but I own a home in California and my mortgage is X amount, but you're only giving me BAH for the Fort Leonard Wood. So just, just the administrative nightmare, because we had to go from individuals, uh, they call it tour of duty, all 200 individuals had to be entered one at a time through this process. You couldn't do a blanket order, et cetera. So just, just a pain in the neck. We understood that those eight companies, we made the assumption that the Army was going to stay at the 476, and they would have to be backfilled by active uh, recruiters. I'm sorry, active drill sergeants. So we didn't bring in all 180 at the same time. We spread them out from May through September, so they didn't all turn into pumpkins a year later. And that allowed uh, HRC to really al align the former cycles, uh, or align the cycles to get those prior drill sergeants in, and it wasn't a huge bill at one time. Let me talk about HRC and the G1 and this friction that occurs. HRC, I'm sorry, the G1 is looking at the chief. All they care about is the end strength. Did you make the end strength? Are you at 476K? HRC is now worried about MOS fidelity. They don't want to bring in infantrymen just because they're easier to recruit, and then we've created a bulge two or three years from now. We got PME issues uh, with, that, the, with promotions, the whole nine yards. So there's this friction between HRC and G1, and then in comes TRADOC that says, I can't train the MOSs that you're asking us to hire because the training base is already saturated. This year was the first time that we actually went back to HRC and said, here are the seats that we could train, Vice, here's what the requirements of the Army are. You could give me all the aviation mechanics in the world, but until somebody figures out how to put a fourth eight-hour training day in, it's not going to happen. Oh, by the way, What's the impact of running the equipment 24 hours a day? Some classes out at the Patriot Trainer, we can only go two hours a day because those, those radars, that equipment has to go under PMCS and maintenance to maintain it. We hadn't quite figured out that impact. So there's this friction of the three big players in this process of what you can do uh, and how you can accomplish it. Um, I talked about drill sergeants. I talked about facilities. Simple things like equipment. Eight new companies, where do those M4s come from? You know, Army's got a ton of M16s and we had to make decisions. If you were in a non-combat arms MOS, your marksmanship training is gonna be with an M16, you'll get introduced to Mr. M4 when you get to your unit. But then that equipment's gotta be moved, drop shipped, and all that kind of stuff, and, and those are the types of things uh, that we force our way through. Let me talk a little bit uh, about advanced individual training. During General, I think it was Wallace's time frame, there was a decision to transition AIT platoon sergeants, AIT platoon sergeant from a drill sergeant to an AIT platoon sergeant. The thought process was there's the authority, the father figure, mother figure of a drill sergeant with a brown round, and these young men and women don't know how to react when they show up at their first unit of assignment and deal with a squad leader. So there was this thought of, let's turn him into an AIT platoon sergeant. So let's talk about AIT platoon sergeants, holdovers, holdunders. Drill sergeant ratio is about one to 22, 12 drill sergeants per company. We now have AIT platoon sergeants with ratios of one to 100. Oh, by the way, of that 100, he's got kids going to training, three eight hour shifts, so how does he manage his 24-hour day to make sure that Pascal and Jones and Barney are in the right spot? Oh, by the way, he's working harder, longer, with a higher instructor-student ratio, doesn't get to wear the brown round, doesn't get a drill sergeant pass, and doesn't get special duty assignment pay that a drill sergeant receives. So we went back out to AIT platoon sergeant and said, hey, we need your help. We're going to give you a, a, 
assignment incentive pay to stay a year, and just as like everything else, we're only going to give you half of what a recruiter or a drill sergeant is going to get. We had 18 take us up on that. I don't blame them. So we have a process uh, at the building right now. We are trying to reinstitute drill sergeants back in AIT. We just finished uh, a semi-annual, or I guess it's a biannual survey with uh, the operational force. And the biggest complaint we have from the first unit of assignment is individual discipline. And part of that may be, I may have put it all on AIT platoon sergeants, but we really need to reinstitute the drill sergeant as an instructor in AIT. Oh, by the way, those AIT platoon sergeants um, are oftentimes reinforcing those lessons learned from basic training, warrior tasks and battle drills. Ideally, it's the same MOS so they can kind of help coach or counsel kid, young men and women if they're having problems. Um, I think it's going to, everybody has the support. We're back to the special duty pay for them. It's not a huge cost, but we're, we're trying to get that in there. I, I talked about professional military education. What are the downstream costs? How are we going to get at that? Uh, more to follow, and so I made you hit it at promotion rates, NCOES, and all the training that's associated with it. So those are some of the levers that we pulled to try to meet this mission this year. Next slide. This is really a chart that we used to track the traps, and there were seven traps to make this. And the way you read this chart, these blue bars are linked training. Again, remember I said, you have to have an AIT seat to enlist a young man or woman. So these bars, when we started out, were probably down here because that's what we had planned for. So we had to bring it on this AIT. So the phenomena of young men and women listing into the Army, and we alluded to it a little bit, early on in the first quarter, it's usually pretty good. Young men and women coming out of high school, boom. We call it, lovingly refer to it as the bathtub months. Between the months of January and the first part of June, USAREC traditionally misses their mission. It's just because that's not who comes into the Army then. The only ones that way to come into the Army after the Christmas holidays are those that haven't joined the Army, they can't find a job, and we would have to lower our standards to bring them in. So the year prior, we had seen this phenomena happen the last two or three years. We adjusted the mission flow. It drives the Army crazy. It would be ideal to say, we're going to train 8,000 soldiers a month, and then you have at it. But that's not how we get to. So in these bathtub months, we might only train 4,000, 3,000, 5,000. So we have some capacity that drives the Army crazy. I think TRADOC, we should use that as an opportunity. So as we plan another AWA or an NIE, if we could plan it during that timeline, there's a workforce that we could potentially tap into. Just something to think about as we move forward. We always plan it during the summer, but guess what? That's when we're the, the busiest. So I will tell you that between May, uh, I'm sorry, between January and June, USAREC missed their accessions mission by 3,758 soldiers. So I listen to Jeff Snow, and I read uh, Jeff Snow, who's a good friend of mine, his updates to the chief. He says, hey, don't worry. I'll make it up in the third and fourth quarter. A seat not used is a wasted resource. I have no capability to roll that to the third and fourth quarter. So now we had to add 6,000 seats to the system. Let's add 3,758 seats to the system. So just under 10 seats. In, the, in from June through September. We've got to get those seats on the system. we got to get 10,000. Yeah, um, what did I say? Yeah, I'm sorry, 10,000 seats uh, onto the system. Only, and we have to get them on early enough so USAREC can begin recruiting against them. So that's kind of the give and take throughout the fiscal year uh, that we deal with uh, trying to bring them on. So the first trap, this was just uh, reinstated of some reduction, so not a big deal. 
Basic training class size is 220. The first trap we did, non-resource intensive or uh, resource neutral, we just increased the class size to 240. That's a stroke of a pen. Second trap we did, and the reason we have to do them separate, second trap, let's kick up class size to 260. That now requires an additional drill sergeant per platoon. Remember I talked about resources, you know, we're, we're ideally it's 12, 12 drill structures per platoon. You got one going on duty, one coming off duty. The rest of TRADOC is resourced to 80%. So you talk about direct support to training events, the committees, the BRM committee, the land nav committee, they're not manned appropriately. So we're finding drill sergeants doing other things than being drill sergeants. On any given day, and General, General uh, Frost is in his review right now, you probably have about five or six drill sergeants per company. We're asking a lot out of them. So we kicked it up to uh, 260. Talked about the prior service. This was to bring on the active component. Uh, and then 1801 was a large trap. You could see it added about 11,000 seats, and it was what we just talked about. You have to be careful, and the reason we added this chart, this is a sessions. We average about, I think, what is it, 4.5 seats per soldier. If you go to OSIT, one station unit training, that's one seat. That's at Fort Benning. If you go to 88 Mike, you're a two-seater because you go to Fort Benning or Fort Leonardwood or somewhere for basic, and then you require a second seat for your AIT, and we have multiple AITs that can go two, three, four phases. Start bringing in the Guard and Reserve, split training options. You know, PASCO gets basic one summer, AIT the next summer. So you got to take all that into account. So this was just a tracking method that we used to track the traps. And we had to get the bars up to the link training, which allowed USAREC to make their accessions mission. Next slide. This was a chart that we created for General Perkins to kind of help educate our senior leaders. I've talked through a lot of this. Uh, I won't highlight it. If you tell us right now, grow the Army by 10K, here's the times that are really associated with it. Facility and design, those relocatable barracks. Best case scenario, if the pad is still in place, if there's still power, there's still electricity, it's nine months to get through the contracting process to get those facilities in place. And is that data available for the Yes. And the quote was, figure it out. I watched that quote. This is the reverse process, and this is what, and again, I don't, most senior leaders don't understand it. Can you recruit more? Okay. When you bring on these relocatable barracks, remember idle hands, idle mind? That barracks is a mile, two, three miles away from the company and the battalion area. So now you've added more stress on platoon sergeants, et cetera. Sir, Mark? Sir, I was just going to, um, talk a little bit more about what Colonel Ski mentioned. You know, we've not only drawn down more than once, we've increased more than once too. And a lot of lessons were learned last time we increased. 10 years ago during the surge, we did all the things that we absolutely didn't want to do here, primarily reduce standard. You know, and I remember my, when my son graduated from basic training nine years ago, he was in one of those modulars and yeah, yeah. it went away. Yeah. But, um, all that because of the way we plan training. I mean, I was briefing General Mangum so we got rid of three. We, we developed some criteria, safe and secure, unit of command, uh, we, et cetera. We, we had some criteria. We involuntarily extended recruiters, drill sergeants. I mean, yeah. Yeah, morale took a big hit. We were pulling non-commissioned officers who were previously drill sergeants, and re well, recruiters mostly, and made them recruiters again. You know, so rather than deploy with your unit in a surge, now you're going to go back on the block and recruit. Yeah. So there's, there was a lot of... I call them desperate measures to, to rapidly increase the size of the force, you know, because we didn't have the 22 months to accomplish the mission back then. So. And we didn't this year, and we don't this upcoming year. More deliberately planned. I, I took this chart. I, I get to represent, with General Hibbert, we represent uh, ourselves at the TGOSC. 
at the Training General Officer Steering Committee, TTPEG. This is where we get our funding. Let's talk this year. Has the NDA been published? Has the Chief said we're going to grow the Army? Yes. Have we been resourced for it? No. We have had to make a decision, and the mission letter came out with an 80K a session. General Snow's mission just increased now by 18,000 for this next year. I don't have the training seats for 18,000. I used the term earlier, late to knee. So here I was at the TTPEG, all the department, everybody. I used this slide to say, we have to start leaning forward in the saddle. And the quote I got from MNRA and from ABO, nobody's told you to grow the Army. Don't worry about it. If we tell you to grow it, we're going to give you the resources. Late to me. Again, senior leaders, educated folks, they don't understand this process. Time. That's exactly right, sir. Time. They can't give us time. We have, we have leaned forward in the saddle. We have identified barracks at Fort Jackson. The other part I didn't mention, when, you, when I say the trap, when I say trap, the Army doesn't give us any money. TRADOC, you cash flow it. And then at mid-year, we apply for you for to get refunded. We don't always get reimbursed for traps. So what are we going to not do when we're going to increase the Army? So, so you hit on the head, it's time. We're going to do the same thing. We're asking recruiters and drill sergeants to stay on. This was just a timeline to show how long it takes to get a recruiter. OK, a drill sergeant's going to be available in month 10. A recruiter's going to be available in month 9. You think he's putting 10 kids in the Army in his first month on the streets? Probably not. Let's talk about another challenge that General Snow endures. Recruiting stations is part of the Joint, uh, joint Facilities Board. You just can't pick up and move a recruiting station. We have recruiting stations in burned out buildings, bars on the windows. You really want to take your son in there and say, hey, join the Army? When if you go a mile and a half down the street is the new mall where that recruiting station should be. Again, late to need the ability. When a sessions command was taken down, one of the responsibilities for Army marketing went to MNRA. They're very interested in the national marketing plan, but we kind of hamstring General Snow, whose commanders know their local areas better. General Perkins tells a story, yeah. I was talking to a recruiter in uh, Puerto Rico. Great Army commercial. It's all in English. You know, did it take Stevie Wonder to figure out it would have been more effective in Spanish? Um, so being told to execute, we could kind of get some small increases, and that's really just increasing the class size. Here's the intersection. This is where this red line is where we start increasing those holdovers and hold unders and basic and AIT. And that chart was really just to sign a, as you should, sir, it's need, it's time to educate senior leaders. I think I covered all of the, the stuff on the right side. So this year our session's mission is 80K. We're leaning forward. We're going to stand up. Barracks that were scheduled to go into T-Pub in 2021 are now going to be invested this year to bring up the standard only to be renovated two or three years from now. Easier to trap down than to trap up. Even if we don't have the NDA, even if I don't have the budget, we have to plan for worst case scenario to try to make the mission. General Snow is concerned about an 80K mission. He's publicly said 50-50 chance of making the 80K mission. The reason we worry about the end strength is, I'll get you in a second, Mike. Um, the reason we worry about the end strength is more strategic communications. As the chief goes to Congress and says, I need a bigger army, they go back to him and say, you can't even recruit the army that we funded you for. So I'm concerned. We say we're going to get this 80K mission. If we make it, what are the ramifications in the second and third order impacts of not making it and those strategic uh, concerns? Mike. So I'm tracking that the 50-meter uh, the target is FY18, but is there talk about 19 and beyond continue to grow? Yeah, so here's, here's what we did. And uh, this is not necessarily public knowledge, so I'd ask that you wouldn't say anything. It would be an anti-deficiency act for us to plan the SMDR with growth 
without having the latest force file. So what we did for the structure manning decision review for 20 that Ms. Kelly just stood in, we planned for an accession mission that would support a 490K active end strength. So that's how we got around it. So General Perkins has looked at the chief and said, stop worrying about 17, stop worrying about 18. How do we affect those out years? So this SMDR, the accession's mission to maintain a 490K Army, which is a 7K growth this year and a 7K growth next year on the active component. I think the House bill was 10K, the Senate was 5K or something, and that's right in the middle. So that, that's how we're planning. But again, you, you're working with FM, what's the force structure gonna be? We could plan for that, but how do I know what, if I don't know the force structure, I don't know what the AIT seats that I need. How do I get those AIT instructors on assignments? Let's start talking about the AIT instructors. Operational force doesn't mind it, you know, but Sergeant First Class Travers just finished his MRX, getting ready to go, and then we reach in and pull him out to be a drill sergeant or a recruiter. Most of the commanders have told General Perkins, we don't mind it, we just want some predictability so we can plan accordingly. Traps don't help us out to do that. Next. That, that's where it really intersects with uh, what we do on the organizational side and, and it intersects at the TAA. So the TAA is done, we determine what force structure is needed to what size, it's got, it drives the number of uh, MOSs which drives the AIT which needs to be done, the planning needs to be done two years before it actually hits. So the E-dates for these units is important. Uh, when you start pulling the E-dates uh, back, it impacts Dave's side of the building uh, tremendously on uh, MOS production. And then it impacts, of course, uh, General Snow's uh, mission to bring uh, them in as well. Hey, sir, um, John Tuig. Uh, one point uh, that I would make here is this is part of the much larger personnel to structure friction that the Army is facing today. Uh, there's a palm planning task, used to be called great plate, then face to space is now personnel and friction mismatch, to where uh, currently today, uh, if you look at the aggregate, the Army is excess about four or 5,000 officers and enlisted in under, under uh, inventory about 780 or the other warrants at the aggregate level. And that's what G1 is graded on, the aggregate level. When you start to add this basic training AIT, getting the training, initial entry training done in soldiers to the units with the other requirements at all uh, officer warrant and officer enlisted at all grades at all MOSs at the right location, there is a divergence that they estimate that we have approximately 80,000 officer, warrant officers, and enlisted soldiers that are not properly aligned with the position today at the grade, at the officer, warrant officer, grade, MOS, and location level. And we have about 70,000 positions, TDA in tow, that are not manned at the right officer, warrant officer, enlisted, grade, MOS, location level. There's that divergence. That's why units are 120% strength in the operating force, but deploy at less than 80% officer, warrant officer, enlisted, grade, MOS, location level. So this is a significant challenge the Army faces, and I think this briefing that we received gets at the issue of if you're making changes in the year in execution and in the first budget year, our systems, it's impossible for our systems to be responsive enough at the accessions, AIT, initial entry training level, as well as all other levels. And that's why there's a major effort now to stand up an OPT to figure out how we can improve uh, these systems and make them more responsive. But the major contributing factors pointed out here is uncertainty of end strength in the NDAA, uncertainty of dollars, and changes in the year of execution that, that drive this system nuts. There are 475 
officer, warrant officer, enlisted skills or MOSs. That's just a number of skills. Not take, not take into account grade and then take into account ASI. How the hell can the Army man itself? This is an enormous challenge, and there's finally an OPT being stood up to try to figure this out. Over. Hey, John, great. I, I, I saw your slide yesterday. I, I concur. And let me, let me give you one more vignette, counterintuitive to senior Army leaders. The longest wait I have in AIT right now is nine plus weeks. Going on probably 10 or 11 is for 13 foxes. It's a shortage MOS in the Army. If you remember the SFAB, the chief said everybody's going to have a JFO 13 fox. So I have a backlog of 158 13 foxes. We trade OC are manned at 63% for 13 fox instructors. So we've done the math. General Perkins has talked to senior leaders. If you give me 20 staff sergeants as instructors, not only will I knock out that backlog, I'm going to produce 300 more a year. And the response is, I can't. Those 13 foxes need to go to the operational force. Okay? Yeah, talk it's, about Objective T a little bit. Yeah. You hit on the head. So Objective T, having the right MOSs, the folks in training. John, I know you talked a little bit about the readiness enhancement account. We can't get the readiness enhancement account right because we're still filling, uh, filling units. So if we grow the Army 10,000, I have looked at General Perkins at EI and said our best assessment is our backlog will be 6,000 people. And he says that is not enhancing readiness. That's 6,000 people eating, sleeping in barracks, doing their business that are not out in the operational army. That's why I said sometimes it's counterintuitive. An investment in the generational force can help improve the personnel rating of the operational force. 13 Foxes is just one vignette. I got it. That's a shortage MOS. However, give me 20, and you're going to get a net sum game of about 430 or something like that. Hey, sir, I'm John Twig. One interesting point to, to support your argument is that um, the Army has established a re uh, readiness enhancement account. In the active component at uh, 476, it's going to be about 10,159 soldiers. In the Guard, it'll be 8,000. In the USAR, it'll be 4,000. And the whole reason for that is to solve the problem that we don't get the, the trained and ready soldiers to write MOS and grade at the unit. The challenge is the estimates that I've seen, and I've, I've, they're still working them, of those 10,000 soldiers at end state in two, 2021, I think it is, they'll have the, suppose the whole rebuilt. It'll probably be effective for about three or 4,000 spaces that'll actually be at the right MOS grade and location. So because of not resourcing TRADOC and other things, uh, we are gonna throw 10,000 spaces to get three or 4,000. That's not very efficient use of our resources. Over. I, I concur wholeheartedly. So as we move forward, should we be creating more organizations and more flags or filling the organizations that we have to standard with the right MOS? I don't have the answer to that question. So um, this is my last slide. Uh, I, I'll entertain any questions. It really shows you we got about nine traps on there. And oh, by the way, I'm planning a bathtub trap. I know that General Snow and his team during the bathtub months are going to come up short and we're going to have to reschedule. My problem is right now with a 10K mission, which is what we're planning an increase, I have no flexibility or agility in the third and fourth quarter. We won't be able to take any more soldiers. So we're going to... We're going to your depth is drained. Our depth is drained. That's where your reservoir would be in order to fill in some of the bathtub. Some of the bathtub months. So the other thing, thanks to the Department of Defense, MAVNIs, Mission Ascent, Accession Vital to National Interest. MAVNIs are pretty good because they're usually educated and they help us with our quality marks. Because of the insider threat, no MAVNI can enter the Army or begin training until their entire background investigation is complete. It used to be they had to be started. We have about 1,850 MAVNIs in the training base sitting still that can't move. 
we have maybe 4,000, I say maybe, that have been in the dip for two plus years. We can extend it to a third year. I'm not even sure if the log jab opened up, do you want to still come in the Army after we've made you wait for three years? Just to make things interesting, green card holders, I-551s, local per uh, legal permanent residents, LPRs, they used to just have to have a background check, they could come into the Army. The Department of Defense just changed that and said they now have to have a complete security clearance before they even ship to the Army. That's going to affect about 5,000 people. So back to this ADK mission, General Snow can't tap into the Mamney population. Now his ability to tack into legal permanent residence has just been affected. So we're making our Army recruiters jump through hurdles. Might as well get the PAO guys working on a third quarter article about how the Army uh, is going to fail to meet our mission. I know Jeff Snow, he's worried about that. He is, sir. He is. Any questions? I've been yapping up here for an hour. I'm sorry I took too long, but I'll entertain any questions that you might have if I haven't answered them already. Hey, sir, uh, John Twink. Uh, in, in looking at the, um, the, the three friction areas for this, um, for the overarching issue that this is a major part of, what are the, um, the policy, um, what are the, um, what are the different things that you see uh, the, the Army could do itself to help begin to address this problem? I know one thing that the force management community could do is if we, if we were to schedule change over longer periods of time and delay initiation of a change so that there's time to plan for it would be one way to help ease the burden. But what are some of the other things that are self-inflicted wounds that we have control over? And what are the, the wounds that have been caused external to the Army uh, that would require us to go back uh, and change DOD policy or to change law? Over. I think the DOD policy is going to be the MAVNI and the uh, legal permanent residence. We need to adjust that policy. The Army MNRA is going back for waivers. You could man, the short, short answer would be to man TRADOC to the 80%. General Dias and I have been in the room with the boss and says, I'm willing to do more with less. Give me the less. We are not even getting the less. Our manning requirements are 80%. I think we have, uh, I don't know the exact number. We have multiple MOSs that we are 50% or less on our instructors. So if you manned us appropriately, we could help getting at some of the backlog. From a, from a yeah, force to... On my side, Dave, it's uh, the capability development enterprise. Sure. Looks like. So if we're manning platform instructors at 100% and TRADOC is manned at 80%, then what is left over to yeah. go to capability development. So, so I'd argue. I can tell you, Fort Huka is less than 50% NCOs I, and their tickums and. I CEOs. would argue that even if, I'm not saying man AIT instructors at, eight, at 100, 80% would be good because we could make it up. So let's just kind of talk about a holistic look at this. 25% headquarters reduction, we're all aware of it. We are potentially going to RIF instructors at Fort Huachuca as part of that 25% reduction. How do I make up instructors? Contractors. I'm also involved with the G8 in the, and General Dice is very aware of it, this service contract reduction. TRADOC, take a 5% reduction in service contracts, maintain the same level of effort, don't cut anything out. So on one hand, I'm gonna get rid of instructors. Over here, I'm supposed to bring in contract instructors. And then the third hand is telling me to cut my service contract that those instructors come from. Those are just some of the challenges that we deal with on a regular hey, basis. Sir, I know it, it may not be a popular subject, but how about adjusting? And, and you know, I've dealt with the challenge of recruiting and recruiters and drill sergeants, um, you know, being selected for my units. And, you know, the, the positions of trust is a discussion that, you know, my peers and I always have. Yeah. I mean, are they too demanding? Is it something that we are... I mean, I, I know I think it is. Is, is something that we have to manage. But. We're going back. We were going hard, I'll be honest. We were going hard to address the level two category. 
And just as we had our VTCs with the department, there was the unfortunate incident of those drill sergeants at Fort Benning. So here you are saying, hey, we think pasta, and the Army is the only one that requires pasta of the, of the other services. So here we are saying, hey, we think pasta's outlived its usefulness. Sergeant Travers has recovered. He's a good guy. Oh, by the way, those drill sergeants, that was a hold over, hold under population. It wasn't the trainee population. We're all going to have bad eggs at some point or time. So we're still going back and we're trying to work the waiver piece for the level twos, which are those other non-sexual related incidences. So, so our Major Davenport's aware of it. We're working with through the G1, the G4. John, the last thing, and I'll, I'll follow up with your final question. I'm not worried about this year. I'm not worried about 19. It's going to suck, but we're going to figure out how to get through it. We need to figure out how to get the force design right for 20, for 21, so we can plan accordingly to what the force is going to look like. There's no other questions. Yes, sir. You know, so what one key point, you know, is we've been, you know, that uh, TAA 1920 uh, addendum to the R truck gave us authority to go to 476, that the current TAA, uh, once the R truck goes with the NDA authority and the chief and the secretary sign off on the R truck, will take us to 490. And for 21, 25, we're planning to grow to 504K. Um, and, but once again, as you know, uh, even if we do in the next five months, which we will accomplish, lay out the, the POM force that will describe where every man, woman, and child needs to be in the Army, that until we get the authority and until somebody gives us authority to program out five or six years in advance, we're going to be chasing our tail uh, for as long as a lot of the majors in this room and captains in this room are in the Army. Over. Concur wholeheartedly. And I worry that we don't get the appropriation to back it up. So we're uh, building the force structure like crazy based on the authorization to have a larger service. And that uh, there's only really three pots of money. You're training and readiness, chief's number one priority. Uh, there's modernization and there's force structure. So growing force structure, uh, uh, maintaining training and readiness, there's really only one place to get it. And so the, the secretary is actively pursuing Capitol Hills. Like uh, we want uh, to lay out our case for modernization for the Army, which uh, also impacts the, and this is why all these things are related to each other. The mission that we have really inside of ARCIC uh, to look at the future, develop the concepts, do the campaign of learning, but also recommend capabilities which are related to uh, force structure and materiel mostly, and the impacts, you know, with the proponents for the Dotmo PF. So, yep, it's all related. They're all tied together. You just, uh, you just don't uh, know it. It's not uh, intuitively obvious how all these things touch each other and are related to each other. And that's, you know, so you, you, you know, and you and I have been in the same room with them, and that's what General Perkins often talks about. It's the relationship of those variables and those decisions that are made without a holistic look at the problem. So, John, I got it. It's a 490K Army, which is at 10K this year, 7K this year, 7K next year. I don't know what that even looks like, and what am I scheduled to train for? So that's going to be our challenge. So I took taking more than my time. Recommend. Thanks for the opportunity. Appreciate it. Uh, Dave, I want to thank you for uh, for doing the presentation. Uh, thanks for attending. We've got, uh, i got a note here that says we got 45 more people in the overflow upstairs. So you fill the Morelli, you fill the overflow. You got all the folks out there at Leavenworth and um, probably a couple of other locations as well. But uh, I want to thank you for the presentation. And uh, and he, he does live in our building here. So, uh, you know, if you've got questions uh, based on this, uh, professional development uh, form, uh, please uh, feel free to go and ask. Uh, and uh, it all is all part of the TRADOC family, this uh, design part, which we're, we're really in, in, uh, tasked to do, but also the uh, acquire, uh, assess, and improve uh, the Army. It's all tied together. So uh, thanks a lot, Dave. Appreciate okay, uh, thanks, uh, thanks everybody out in VTC land. Uh, everybody else, get back to work.